There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass fed, and grass finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high-quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at butcherbox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious. And all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm and use code etm to choose your free offer and get $20 off. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, Right. For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. The best thing you can do is stop and take a deep breath and look at what you're feeling and why you might be feeling it. So whenever you feel that sense of anxiety, that sense of guilt, that sense of whatever it is, stop and take a deep breath. And that gives you the opportunity to gain some metacognition, to gain some perspective on what's going on. Because we are all so driven by fear, you know, by fear that we'll be seen as doing the wrong thing, that our that our parents will be mad at us, that, you know, we we might you know, be destitute and left with nothing, that we might have done something, whatever it is. These fears are rarely true. And the worst case scenario that you're dreaming of rarely happens. Yet these fears really guide our lives and our micro movements in ways that hold us back. Welcome to Everyone's Talking Money podcast. I'm your host, Shauna Game. There's no judgment, no dumb questions, just smart conversations about you and your money. So come on in and grab a seat. Everyone is welcome here. Hello, my friend. So good to have you here. Okay, I sincerely hope you love this episode as much as I do. If you want to make changes with your money or really any area of your life, you've got to understand the messages your brain is sending out. Did you know that your brain can literally make or break your financial success? Yes, of course, more money is always a better thing. I'm not going to argue that money is not important, but your brain plays an equal, maybe if not more partner than the actual amount of money that you have. So you could be capsizing your quote unquote money boat just by way of how you're thinking. Our guest, Ariel Garten, is a neuroscientist. She's way smarter than me. (laughs) She's a mom, former psychotherapist, former fashion designer, which she says is not the best business idea, and co-founder behind the startup Muse. So Muse is really cool. It tracks your brain during meditation to give you real-time feedback. More on that later, more in the conversation. But Ariel is here to help you demystify what the heck is going on in your brain, how you can reprogram limiting money beliefs and thoughts in a really healthy way, and the benefits of meditation for your money, and just, my gosh, so much more. So on the list of maybe top 25 
episodes, uh, this one's going to be somewhere near the top. Let's jump into the conversation. Ariel, I am so, so excited to have you on the show. I've been looking forward to this conversation for such a long time. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's my joy and my pleasure. I'm really excited to be here. And I really like the topic of money as an entrepreneur, you know, you <laughs> focus on making it. And uh, as a meditator, there's actually a ton of ways that meditation helps your ability to manage your money. It's it's so good. I love it. And we have so much we're going to talk about. And obviously on the show, we talk about a lot of how-tos when it comes to money, but I'm really passionate about talking through the whys and really understanding how your brain, like quote unquote, does money, because that obviously is a, a factor in our money success and our money decisions. I think one thing we don't think about is our brain and maybe like the messages it's sending us about feelings towards money, maybe our limitations, our doubts, all of these things. So I think maybe it makes sense to start with just even a general understanding of how the heck our brains even work. <laughs> I realize we could be here for like four hours, but yeah, not a I mean, simple just, question. Yeah, we but, don't um, we don't we don't learn that stuff. I mean, really, you know, and and it's like, wait, there's actually something going on up there. Yes, there are a number of layers of things going on up there. So on the one hand, you have the neural connections, the firing and wiring together of neurons that drive our behavior. On the other hand, you have the layers of thoughts that we have, and those are informed both by the information that we gather from the world and the set of beliefs that were created that guide how we think, act, feel, etc. So when we kind of zoom in to talk about money, there's lots of different places we can dive in. You know, one is on the dopamine reward connection and how that can help or hinder us in our spending and saving. And the other is on the thoughts and beliefs that we have built as a child and how we can potentially shift and change those. Yeah, I'd like to go into both. I mean, obviously, we're getting close to the holidays, which is a big sort of spending time. Uh, let's Let's first talk about that dopamine hit, because I think we all even if we're trying not to spend money, sometimes we find ourselves spending money and afterwards it's the, the, why did I do this? I, you know, I mean, there's, there's so many um, kind of negative thoughts that go through our brains, but like what is happening inside of us when, when we are spending money? So we have these very, very basic dopamine reward cycles. So when we want or we desire something and then we fulfill that desire, we get a big release of dopamine. And that is rewarding to our mind and body. It tells us that we've done something that's great. It feels really good. So just as a connection, um, when you're high on cocaine, for example, it activates the same dopamine reward center where, you know, you feel great and you're like attracted to all of these things. Um, when we then sit back and look rationally and logically at what we've done, we can have all sorts of rational and logical sensations that then trigger emotions like, remorse, um, you know, second <laughs> thoughts, you know, wondering why we did this. Um, but is, it is that often that dopamine driver that drives us in the first place. Now, there's an interesting study here on the reward systems in our body. And they did a study where they gave individuals money, just like here's five bucks. And they tracked the level of happiness or reward that they spent. So they got to get five bucks, spend it on themselves, and then they got to get five bucks and spend it on somebody else or give the money away to somebody else. And they actually found significantly larger uh, reward and happiness um, validation that an individual would get from giving the money or the gift to somebody else than if they spent the money on themselves. So wow. interesting little note around the holiday season. If you want to get a big zip, giving is a good way to do it. Wow, it's so it's so interesting. Uh, so, are there ways then for us to? I mean, I, I guess to really like understand that dopamine hit, but to be able to like use it, I guess in a good way. I mean, we obviously just talked about giving away money, but is there a way for us to process through that dopamine hit and to really understand like what that's doing for us? Yeah. So one of the best ways to process through the unconscious behaviors that we have and the unconscious drivers that we have is meditation. So, you know, in a meditation practice, what you learn to do is to observe yourself without doing these things. So you might sit there in a five minute practice and feel the urge to, you know, 
go up and eat some cookies. Let's not talk about money. Let's talk about cookies because it's like so easy to understand. And <laughs> who doesn't in, love cookies, who right? Doesn't love cookies. <laughs> And so for a lot of people in our general lives, the thought of cookie comes into your head. And if you happen to have some cookies readily available in the kitchen, it's not a large leap for you to just follow that random thought of cookie, go towards the kitchen, open it up and eat that cookie, and then feel the intense dopamine reward that comes from a cookie. There's you know sugar, there's fat, and there's the satisfaction of doing what we set out to do, even if what we set out to do is not that great in the first place. <laughs> In a meditation practice, you will sit there and the thought of cookie will arise and you'll notice that thought. And then you might feel the sensation in your body that just automatically happens. So this is a very cool thing about a dop our dopamine system. It's responsible both for reward and for movement. So mm -hmm. in that moment when you're thinking cookie, your dopamine system is also mobilizing your body into action towards the cookie in order to get you the thing that you want. And so you are literally unconsciously beginning to set up a set of actions in your body to move yourself towards cookie. So when you're sitting there in your meditation, you might actually notice the sensation of urge in your body, like the urge to like get up and move, like, you know, that feeling of like, I'm just going to get up there and walk towards the kitchen. But you don't follow that. You just observe it. And then you might, you know, find these feelings continually nagging at you, like the thought of cookie just keeps returning, the urge to move just keeps returning. You get frust frustrated because you can't do it. And you're sitting there observing yourself being like, what on earth is going on? This is crazy. And through that act of observation of not just following the unconscious patterns that we always do, um, we start to actually unpattern them. Because in the past, the thought of cookie was wired to the movement towards cookie, was wired to the consumption of cookie and the dopamine reward. That's one very nice circuit in our brains that plays through. And every time it plays, it gets stronger and stronger. When you have the thought of cookie and the urge of cookie and you do not follow through on it, you simply observe it, your body starts to untether these associations and untether the thought of cookie from the automatic moving towards and consuming of cookie. So mm. the act of observation and adding intention and awareness into our actions literally helps us repattern our brains towards the behaviors we're actually choosing rather than ones that we're doing automatically. And this could be cookie or, you know, buying nice person shoes or whatever it is for you. And how long does that repatterning take? Because I, I mean, I've tried this myself with certain things, certain things that make me very nervous or anxious, whatever it might be. And I noticed that I'll do really good with it for a while and then I'll just have a complete meltdown. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute, is this, I did all this work. So I, I'm curious, like when we're trying to repattern ourselves, if we're talking again about money or cookies or whatever it might be, what is that process like? So the process is slow, but rewarding. Interesting to use that word there. You know, we're rewarding ourselves now for healthy behavior. Um, so, you know, the first five times you do it, you might just feel the sensation of cookie and say, F it, I'm going to get a cookie. <laughs> it just, it feels too overwhelming. <laughs> and then, and then as you do it, as you become more and more comfortable sitting, as you become more and more able to say, hold on, this is crazy. Why am I following the surge? I don't need to. When you become more comfortable with the idea of just watching the urge rise and fall or the anxiety rise and fall, because if you want this thing and you're not doing it, it can actually like raise anxiety inside of you. But the more you become comfortable with the fact that that anxiety might raise and you still don't have to do the thing, you can just watch your anxiety rise and eventually it'll just fall. The urge will, you know, build and eventually the urge will just dissipate. You become better and better at recognizing that you don't actually need to follow these unconscious urges. And it's a slow process, but the more that you do it successfully, the more you reward yourself for it. And the more you're through the reward of being like, hey, I just like didn't get that cookie. That's amazing. The more that strengthens the connection of non-action, of repatterning, of you know, creating a new, a new neural circuit um, that allows you to have this, you know, intervention of your own will and your own top-down control on, on top of the automaticity. It's really interesting because I'm, of course, not a neuroscientist. I'm a money expert, but when I was working with people one-on-one, -on -one, I worked with people for about 10 years. And regardless of the amount of money they had, the demographic, the education, whatever it might be. I always saw that the missing piece to actually creating that change and 
and really getting closer to the thing that they actually wanted was when they would have this mindset shift or like an aha moment when something suddenly makes sense or they understood a pattern from their childhood. And then it was like you just hit the fast forward button. And, you know, some people would would go very fast and then kind of stumble backwards and then go fast again. But it was like this revelation that at least when we're talking about money, it isn't just about spreadsheets and numbers that whatever is going on in our head or isn't going on is is helping or hindering us and that we actually have some sort of control over that. And and to me that's always been at least you know in my opinion the missing piece when we're talking about something specifically like money but we could apply that I'm sure that same theory to about anything in life. Yes, we have a pile of unconscious drivers. And again those can fall into the categories of just our neurological circuitry and patterning, you know, based on basics of reward and the things that we've just done over and over again habitually so we no longer think about it, the patterns that have become automatic that we just follow, um, and the beliefs that we have. And either uncovering one of the patterns, like we talked about with the cookie urge, um, and being able to overcome it, or uncovering one of the beliefs that you have that's not correct that drives you, both of those are massive aha moments that actually serve in that moment to help reorganize your neural constructs and your conscious constructs. Now, of course, these patterns, be they neural or you know childhood beliefs, are deeply ingrained. And so once you find it, it leads to this massive aha. It's like the scales have fallen off your eyes. It's like, oh my God, I can actually have control over this. And then from there, it takes discipline and practice to keep reminding yourself of the new thing, to keep saying, oh, yeah, you know, I might have believed that I wasn't worthy of making this much money or that I had to, you know, never use my credit card because that's what my parents always told me because it would take me too far into debt. But actually that, you know, led me to some poor decisions or that I shouldn't ever mortgage my home, which actually then kept me from having a significant amount of free income, which I could then invest in an investment, you know, like things, whatever your unconscious belief is. Once you uncover it, you then have to do the work over and over again of reminding yourself that that was your belief, but that's not necessarily true. And the world can work in a different way and continue to reshape. And, you know, it takes time on the order of months, it's for some people years, <laughs> but once it's unlocked, it's a world that's unlocked for you. So if you recognize like one of those beliefs, maybe that's been passed down from from childhood that you think, okay, this is actually not my belief. This is somebody else's that I've borrowed. And we're reminding ourselves over and over again what our actual belief is. Is it helpful to like have that written down, like something that we can come back and read over and over again? Or is it something that we just like repeat to ourselves? Like what's the actual practice of walking through that? Sure. All of the above. So one is, you know, we call them core beliefs. So these are the beliefs that drive you and drive your behaviors. So once you recognize that you have a core belief that is not actually aligned to your current reality and no longer helping or serving you, you want to, of course, write out what the old core belief is and what the new core belief that you would like to have replaced is. Now, that old core belief is your body really believes it. You're, you know, your mind and your body is really focused on this is how it has set up its its entire structure for how you see the world in this particular domain. And so you might find that there are lots of different places where this core belief has has inserted itself. And so you might say like, oh, well, I believe that, I don't know, let's go back to the mortgage example that, you know, you should never take on debt, debt on your house. And so, um, of course, you would never take a mortgage. That would seem big and intimidating to you. Like, that would be awful. But maybe you also never lend a friend money. Maybe you also never use a credit card. Maybe you also, you know, have a whole set of beliefs and behaviors, and you have to kind of check where each of those might fall in and say, oh, I'm doing that again based on this core belief. And you might be like, oh, yes, logically, I'm going to change this core belief and this new belief makes a lot more sense to me. But you might get a lot of emotional reaction in situations where your core belief is being challenged, even though you cognitively know it's wrong. So you want to be able to do visualization exercises, like go back to your five-year-old self who was being lectured by your dad about this thing. Um, and 
you know, give some love and support to your five-year-old self. You can even imagine your five-year-old self on the wall, like a movie, seeing the scene where, where your dad was talking to you. And um, maybe you'd then have your five-year-old self actually retort to your dad the, the new information that he maybe didn't have. You know, you would give that information to your five-year-old self like, like a mentor. You know, when your dad leaves the room, you'd then turn to him and say, well, I know dad said this, but actually let me tell you how it actually is. And then see how your life might be different had you done these different things throughout your life. You know, carry this belief. We call it in NLP, we call it a timeline exercise, like carry this belief throughout your timeline. You might, as the anxiety begins, builds if you approach parts of your life where you have to now exercise this new belief, you might feel anxiety. And so you want to bring in a breathing exercise to calm yourself down. So one of the biggest things, the concepts that I like to work with is that fear is not always correct. So, you know, our anxiety is there to tell us that something's wrong. And the thing that it's telling us is wrong is like, oh my God, this action doesn't align with this core belief. And it's like, yes, I'm feeling the sense of a lot of anxiety, but I know this core belief was wrong and this new core belief is true. You know, I can get a mortgage or whatever it is. So when you feel that sense of anxiety, it's your body just acting on an old core belief. And normally when we feel a sense of anxiety, we don't do something because we're like, oh no, that's dangerous. You can't do it. So we have to, in those times when we feel anxiety, take on techniques to calm our body, to send ourselves love, to, you know, hug the little five-year-old who doesn't want to screw up in front of dad. Um, <laughs> I don't whatever know what it is. you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, and so we can become, you know, very comfortable with talking to these parts of ourselves that uh, that are a little bit scared because, you know, we were driven by these core beliefs and now things are changing. And so it's almost like we are finally the adult in the room who sees the reality, who sees that our parents were wrong, who sees that these core beliefs were wrong. And we can go back and comfort, talk to, support, give hugs to our younger selves that are kind of scared and kind of confused and driven by this old belief and, you know, don't want to piss somebody off by doing something wrong. Financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day, or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling, you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T-A-L-K-A-N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash TOS for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank & Trust, member FDIC. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet, finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply.
Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. But I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. Gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. And I want to talk, obviously, a lot about the the techniques and dive a little bit more into meditation. But but really quick, before we get off kind of this topic, I'm curious, are some of our thought patterns, like when we're born, are we just like our disk space is clean? And then the moment we start experiencing life is when some of these beliefs and patterns and all sorts of things start to really shape or is is some of that inherited like in our genes how does that work this is an age-old debate in the world of neuroscience are we tabula rasa you know do we come clean into the world and then everything's patterned on on top of us or do we come with some innate things and certainly we come with some innate drivers you know our dopamine systems generally are innate what what we attach to them you know for some people it might be sex is highly dopamine rewarding for other people it's sugar for other people it's money you know what we attach to that system is then determined by us and our shaping and our experience Um, Mm -hmm. and then in terms of the beliefs that we carry for the most part those are cultured they're not in our genes you know there is some thoughts and epigenetics about things that are passed on from from adults to to child But those don't tend to be on the level of belief. The things on the level of belief are things that we learn psychologically as we grow up. Interesting. So blame your parents. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) That sounds really fantastic. And I'm just kidding. (laughs) So I want to talk about, about meditation. It's something that I started to do about three years ago. I had an accident, became deaf in my left ear. So I have single sided deafness and like 24 seven tinnitus. And so for me, it, also brought along a lot of anxiety and all sorts, a whole bevy of other things. And so I knew from my work in the financial space how important the mindset was and that I needed myself to take like a time out and really work on that myself. And so I turned to meditation. I obviously knew about it, but um, I was really shocked how meditation helped me. And I think there are a lot of I don't want to say beliefs, but there's a lot of um, strong feelings sometimes around meditation, and maybe it comes from just not really understanding what meditation is. So can you walk us through a little bit, like like what actually is at the core level, like what is meditation and, and how is that working to to help us? Sure. This is one of my favorite subjects to talk about. And by the way, I sometimes have ringing in your ears and tinnitus sucks. So my heart goes out to you on that one. But meditation has been demonstrated as one of the only things that can actually effectively help tinnitus. It helps you move your mind away from the sound and therefore dampens your associations and your attention to it. So 
At its core, meditation is not a weird or a woo-woo thing. It is simply a practice or training that leads to healthy and positive mind states. So just in the same way that we go to our gym to train our bodies and make it stronger, we meditate to train our minds and make it stronger. And we're training multiple facets of our mind. And one of the main things that we train in meditation is our attention, our ability to place our attention in the present moment on what we choose to because we go through so much of our life automatically, you know, going after cookies, thinking random thoughts, having repeated thoughts over and over and over in our head. And in meditation, what we learn to do is rather than just buying into all of the stimulus that's constantly coming at us, the commercials, the advertisements, the random thoughts that pop into our head, the cookie desires, etc., we choose to instead let go of all of that noise and choose where we put our intention to be conscious and attentive of what we do, what's around us and what's in our world. And that skill that you build in meditation is mindfulness. So it's the awareness of what's actually going on in our thoughts, feelings, sensation of world. And once you're aware of it, you can then have control of it. You can then choose how you react to the things that are going on around you. So if, for instance, we're feeling a lot of stress around money or um, you know, could be a simple thing, you know, going back to our example of, of, you know, we have an impulse to go out and buy something, spend money. We don't even know why we could utilize meditation to just kind of bring us back to the present and also help us be aware of all sorts of things. Do we need this? Is, you know, I mean, you could go through a whole laundry list I'm imagining of, of ways once you're present to really think about the situation. Exactly. And to deconstruct what's happening inside of you that's driving you. So to see, you know, why is it that I want this? What is my emotional state at the moment? How is that driving me? How is the argument that I just had, you know, with my husband making me just want to make myself feel better in any way possible? And this is, you know, the route that I'm just automatically taking. You know, what are my thoughts about this? How is my body just reacting in this moment? And once you're able to see that, you're able to bring choice into the scenario. We're no longer just driven automatically. And what we discover in long-term meditation practices is actually a strengthening of the parts of the brain associated with making better choices and reducing our stress and anxiety. Instacart shoppers know groceries. They know that you can't make guacamole with rock-hard avocados. They know how to quickly find those peanut butter pretzels you can never find. And they keep you in the know by giving you updates about your order along the way. Let Instacart shoppers help take shopping off your plate so you can get time and energy back for what really matters. Visit instacart.com or download the app to get free delivery on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum order $10. Additional terms apply. Instacart. Add life to cart. I mean, it, it's so fascinating to me because I struggled for years to find some sort of tool or technique that would help. And then for me, just sitting calmly for 10, 20 minutes a day, it it's like the best medicine ever. But for someone who maybe has never meditated before, can you walk us through a little bit? I know there are a myriad of different types of meditations. Like what are you, what are you actually doing in a meditation? And then maybe what are you doing after a meditation? Sure. So the most common form of meditation that most people learn first is focused attention on the breath. So in a basic focused attention on the breath practice, you're putting your attention on your breath, all of your attention, and eventually your mind's going to wander away from your breath and into a thought about the grocery list or your husband or what's frustrating, whatever it is. You then notice, hey, I'm thinking, no longer meditating. You let go of that thought and you bring your attention back to your breath. So it is very, very simple. Intentional attention on the breath, mind wandering, notice that you've wandered, let go of the wander and return. Now from this very simple set of activities, some really profound transformation can happen. Because most of us, as I've talked about, just kind of go through our lives on autopilot. We have a whole bunch of thoughts just sort of rolling around in our head. Um, and we assume that because they're in our head, we're supposed to be thinking them. And, you know, maybe it's a repeated thought about a bad transaction that we did that just, you know, repeats over and over and over and makes us feel terrible. Maybe it's thoughts about something that we want that just comes back over and over and over. Maybe it's just useless garbage. And when you 
for the first time, bring your attention onto something. Then your attention wanders away for a thought. And then you say, hey, I don't need to be thinking this thought. I can move my mind elsewhere. I can move it onto something neutral like my breath. In that very moment, you have changed your relationship to your thinking. And once you do that, you can recognize that you can actually have choice over the contents of your mind. That you don't need to have those repeated thoughts. You know, when a thought comes in, you can say, hey, this is not helping or serving me to think about this again. Let's just move my mind elsewhere. And the more you do that, the better you become at curating the contents of your own mind and really becoming the the master of your own life. I love that. Curating the contents of your own mind. It's It's so profound. I love it. You are multi-talented. I read on your bio, it says you're one of the most interesting people we will ever meet, which <laughs> clearly, clearly is the case. <laughs> uh, you're a neuroscientist, you're a mom, you're a, you are a former fashion designer, which is crazy, and um, the co-founder of the startup Muse, where um, you're doing amazing things to help people with um, just all the stuff that we've been talking about, what was going on in your head. So, I mean, first... Tell me a little bit, like, how did you even get interested in all of this uh, to become a neuroscientist and to really focus on on this area? So my family was entrepreneurial. Um, My dad was in real estate and my mom was an artist. So I always grew up thinking that you did your own thing. You know, you built your own path. You created your own job working for somebody else and giving up all of your labor to that seemed utterly insane to me. And so I was very fascinated by how this world worked and trying to understand it. I then went down the road of neuroscience to understand how the brain works. Uh, Along the way, became a fashion designer, which, by the way, is a terrible business. (laughs) Absolutely terrible economies of scale. (laughs) Just (laughs) not recommended from a business model perspective. It was quite successful. I had a clothing store and, you know, sold clothing across North America. And ultimately, it was actually my dad who said, shut this down. This is not a business that's going to do well for you, which was, you know, a very hard thing for a 20 something to hear. So closed down my clothing design company and really focused on um, my fascination with neuroscience and the brain and trying to figure out actually how I could create a business solution around that that was really going to make people's lives better. And so I started to work with an early brain computer interface system in a research lab in Toronto and quickly recognized that this device that we were using, which was a very simple EEG electrode that you would slip on the back of your head, um, that we would use to then create audio experiences based on your brain state, I quickly recognized that it was something that was commercializable and incredibly useful to the world. So I got together with my co-founders, Chris Amini, who's an incredible, incredible engineer, and Trevor Coleman, who is great at business. And the three of us uh, formed a company, Muse, where we uh, set about to take this brain technology and really make it useful to the world. And we would be able to, you know, have people focus on a light and the light would get brighter and we'd have people relax and we could make the sounds change. So we would actually interpret their brain state into sound. And then through that, they could understand what their brain was doing. And as we tried to figure out exactly what the product was, we recognized that probably as odd as this seems, the best use of this technology was to help people meditate because meditation as simple as it is, is very hard to do. You know, you're asked to focus your breath, your your attention in one space, like on your breath, your mind wanders, and it's really hard to know what's going on in there. It's hard to know what's happening in your brain while you meditate. And with this system that we had, we could actually give people feedback on when they were focused and when they were relaxed. And we could actually use that to build a tool that could teach somebody quite effectively to meditate, to show them when they're in the meditation zone and when their mind was wandering. And that's how the device Muse was ultimately born. Wow. I mean, it's it's just like, it's so amazing because, right, it's like you're training yourself to recognize when I'm relaxed or when I'm not relaxed or like to really understand what's going on in our brains because so much of the time I feel like my brain's doing one thing and everything else is doing something. I'm like, could these two just you know, work together here? (laughs) (laughs) Very much so. Yeah. So with Muse, we really wanted to create a tool that would give you insight into your mind during meditation. 
and yeah. how it now works, the, the existing device, it's a slim little band that you slip on your forehead and it takes the sound, it takes your meditation practice and actually changes it into guiding sounds. So when your mind is wandering, you hear it as stormy. And as you bring yourself to focused attention, it quiets the storm. And there's a mm. gamification aspect to it. So, you know, we're getting that dopamine system going. It's very rewarding. You want to do it over and over again. And it really effectively teaches you how to meditate. And, you know, we hear over and over again from people who've never meditated before, like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Okay, now I get it. And from people who are <laughs> like, oh, and from people who are experienced meditators, it gives you a whole new level of insight into your mind during meditation. So it's, yeah, it's awesome. So curious, also being a, a female startup owner, do you have any uh, words of advice, any money or business advice that you would give to somebody listening who uh, is maybe, you know, a few years removed from your position, but ha has a, has an idea, something they want to chase after, but, you know, has a lot of those, a lot of those fears about money. Is this going to be successful? A lot of those limiting beliefs. Yes. So I started out in a really crazy business. I was creating brain technology that was going to help you meditate. And we were way early for the market. You know, now meditation is a big trend and, you know, literally half a million people use Muse and, you know, many, many, many millions meditate. But early on when we went to raise money for the business, uh, it was not the case. And I'd walk into a VC's office and I'd pitch this amazing technology we had and they'd say, what's the killer app? And we'd say meditation and they'd be like, oh yeah, thanks. Bye. You're weird. <laughs> Many of those VCs currently use Muse. Not kidding. Right. Um, but it took a long time for us to get there. And so along the way, being able to observe my own limiting beliefs, to quiet my inner critic who'd be saying things like, this is crazy, it'll never work, um, was really, really key. And I actually walked into the startup with no real financial background. So you know, my my family was a family business, so I had the sort of just exposure of being in an entrepreneurial environment, but I had no MBA. I didn't have the skills to raise money. Um, and so I went to our local incubator. There, I learned how to raise money. I learned the skills that you need. Um, I brought aboard partners who were really skilled in the things that I wasn't, like spreadsheets and financial management um, and operations and manufacturing things in China. And from there, was able to gain the insight and confidence to go out and actually raise $18 million in venture funding myself. The companies are out now raised much more than that, but the first $18 million I raised. And wow. I did that always with the clear belief that I could figure anything out. So it really was the mindset that was key. It really was overcoming the limiting beliefs that I might have had about me not being good enough, not deserving to be in that room. Who am I to stand in front of these VCs? You know, I really had to work with that internal dialogue to create um, the confidence and the 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 arena for for me to flourish and it was ultimately i think my confidence that the vcs invested in um and then of course the team that i was able to put together and the technology we had and the and the proof that we were able to generate so there's there's a lot of parts of it but the real internal driver the initial driver came from my own confidence and my ability to manage my limiting beliefs and what's so interesting with you being a neuroscientist is that even though you know how all of this works you still have to do the process yourself. And you still had to walk through that yourself. And I think that's just such a testament to um, none of us are really experts. We're just all, we're all learning and we're all practicing and, and falling down and, and standing up again and, and trying to, to make things work. And trying to figure it out. Yes. Um, I was actually, I was working as a psychotherapist uh, along my development path. And while I was building Muse, you know, part of the recognition was how terrible I was at meditating. So as a psychotherapist, I'd be teaching people to meditate and I was a terrible meditator. <laughs> and it was through using Muse that I was finally like, oh, okay, this is what I need to do to meditate. Got it. <laughs> so that's so cool. I yes, like that. We're, we're all working on ourselves constantly. And I know something else you're doing at Muse, which I really want to talk about is really examining the role that sleep plays in our success. Um, you know, I, I know the older I get, 
sometimes the crazier my sleep gets. And it, it's tough when you've got to get up and, and function and you know you've not had enough sleep. And I know particularly with money, something as simple as just not getting enough rest can really be messing up some of our money decisions. I'd love to hear a little bit more about like, the role sleep plays in our success. Absolutely. I mean, sleep is incredibly critical for our success. Simply one hour of sleep can significantly impact your cognitive function. Um, and it's very interesting the ways that it impacts it. So losing an hour of sleep doesn't impact, for example, your decision, your, pardon me, losing an hour of sleep, for example, doesn't impact your memory. So your memory, whether you've slept six hours or eight hours will probably be just as good, more or less. But losing a few hours of sleep severely impacts our decision making. So particularly when we're talking about the area of money in which decision making is key, getting a good night's sleep before you're making any big money decisions is really important. Or if you know you've slept poorly the night before, stopping and saying, hold on, like maybe I'm not going to be making the best decisions today. Uh, let's... <laughs> Let's let's park that one for tomorrow. You know, let's just having that eye on yourself is is really important. Um, and lack of sleep does several things. One is it's terrible for your body. Um, you know, your your satiety signals, um, a range of different hormones, your immune system, etc. But it also erodes our emotional self regulation. So you know, everybody knows a little two or three year olds when they haven't had a good nap starts to throw tantrums and go crazy. And like, you can tell somebody needs to take a nap right now. <laughs> well, us adults, we do the same thing. We just hide it much better. So when we don't sleep well, our emotional self-regulation goes out the window. So that becomes another reason that decision-making really becomes impaired. You know, not only do we have the cognitive impairment on our decision making, but we also have the compound of not being able to emotionally self regulate. So we're far more driven by our fears, our desires, and our anxieties. I mean, and who would think just sleep? I mean, it's it's just crazy because I know there are days where I have not gotten enough sleep and the whole day just feels like a chaotic mess. And I'm blaming everything except really looking at, okay, wait, how well did I sleep last night? And so having this, this awareness now, I think hopefully everyone listening is, is now able to just think about what emotions they're feeling, but also just think about what's happened, you know, the night before and uh, figure out, like you said, is it a good day to make big decisions? Maybe not. Yeah. And how can you improve your sleep to make every day a good day? You know, how can you prioritize sleep in your life to ensure that every day is as good a day as it could be? Yeah, that is that is definitely something I'm working on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's something that we've been working on too. So, you know, as we think about ways to improve the brain, one of the things that we've actually just released at Muse is a new device, Muse S, that actually helps you fall asleep and stay asleep. So it has a great new intervention that helps you fall asleep um, and it's designed to help you stay asleep and fall back asleep and also tracks your sleep like almost as precisely as a sleep lab to actually give you real insight into your sleep and how to improve it. Ooh, yeah, that's fascinating. I love it. Oh my gosh, we have talked about so, so much on this episode. I'd love to leave everyone with just maybe one like parting thought. If If you could leave us with some sort of advice, tip, word of wisdom, anything about how we could right now, right in this moment, really work to maybe overcome what our brain is telling us about our money situation. I think so many of us are so critical about the mistakes we've made and we really live in this place. Is there anything proactive we can do right now to uh, at least bring some awareness to the reality or what is actually going on? Yes. The best thing you can do is stop and take a deep breath and look at what you're feeling and why you might be feeling it. So whenever you feel that sense of anxiety, that sense of guilt, that sense of whatever it is, stop and take a deep breath. And that gives you the opportunity to gain some metacognition, to gain some perspective on what's going on. Because we are all so driven by fear, you know, by fear that we'll be seen as doing the wrong thing, that our that our parents will be mad at us, that, you know, we we might you know, be destitute and left with nothing, that we might have done something, whatever it is. These fears are rarely true. And the worst case scenario that you're dreaming of 
rarely happens. Yet these fears really guide our lives and our micro movements in ways that hold us back. So observing that whenever you have a sense of fear, noticing that actually it's probably based on something old and not helpful and it's probably not helping or serving me right now, calming yourself and taking deep breaths to calm that fear sensation or anxiety sensation, and then objectively looking at the situation so that you can make a clearer decision is always key. Amazing. Okay. Well, tell everyone listening where they can go to find out more about Muse and connect with you. Sure. Um, you can find out more about Muse at choosemuse.com, C-H-O-O-S-E-M-U-S-E.com. Um, there you can find out about our tool to help you meditate and the tool to help you sleep. And if you want to follow me on socials, you can follow me at Ariel's Musings and on Twitter at Ariel.Garten. Wow is all I have to say after this conversation. I have been practicing meditation, mindfulness, and really trying to understand money thoughts for years now, but I learned so much from Ariel. I think the biggest takeaway I got is that there is hope. You can work to change your thinking and become more intentional. And all of that is just going to have a great impact on your money. So that feels like really good news to me. If you enjoyed this podcast, do me a favor, share it with five friends right now that you know need to hear this message. That is the biggest way we keep the show growing. We keep more great guests like Ariel coming on. Always, you can head to the show notes for all our links to our guests, as well as our episode sponsors. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC.